and I love him. Outrageous. Sex. A bunch of sex. You guys are bitches. I love you. <laughs> Get the fuck out. Excuse me, man. These guys make me crazy. <laughs> Wasp was actually something that was a brainchild of both myself and Chris Holmes that didn't really come to pass until about almost seven years after the fact. We had a band originally called Sister. Sister was the first band to do things like using a five-pointed pentagram, a symbol that's now used where the people are showing the horns of the devil. Out of the Sister experience, I met a guitar player, uh, this tall, blonde, young man, 19 years old, named Chris Holmes. Oddly enough, believe it or not, I was thumbing through a, a copy of Hustler magazine. <clears throat> and uh, there, there's a section in there, if you're familiar with, with Hustler, there's a section in the back called Beaver Hunt, which is where all these voyeuristic men send uh, these somewhat less than professional snapshots of their wives and what have you. And uh, they always have one for the ladies, usually, and it's just for ladies only. Well, I looked at him, here's this, this blonde thing standing there, and it's uh, up underneath it, it says rock and roll animal, and I, <laughs> I showed it to the drummer at the time, I says, look at this geek. Look at this guy, a character or what? Real funny, he called me up, and he says, well, I hear a guitar player. I says, yeah, I play guitar. Because he saw the ad in the magazine. And the first thing I said to him was, uh, how tall are you? And he said, 6'5". I said, how long is your hair? He goes, about halfway to my rear end. I said, you got any zits? He goes, no. I said, come on down. <laughs> Sister broke up in 1978. We went back to the drawing board. And a few years, about four years went by uh, from the time of Sister to Wasp. And Wasp then incorporated this idea of psychodrama, which I've since been told is psychotic people doing drama. At the time we first started playing uh, with Tony, Randy, Chris, and myself, we started playing at a, a club in Hollywood called The Troubadour. Somebody was asking me the other day how I got the idea for the song Animal. I said I hooked up a videotape in my bedroom, rolled it back, made it rhyme. Within the first few gigs that we had played at the Troubadour early on, we were showing signs of making progress on leaps and bounds. Uh, the show came about largely by a series of mistakes. We, we had an idea for a type of theater that was being developed called psychodrama, where you try to take what's happening on the stage and put it into the audience as much as possible to get the audience involved. Now, that's where the meat came from. We used to chop up the meat and throw it into the crowd. And to us, the reasoning behind that was that, yes, it was a very crude form of theater, but it was like going to a baseball game. You had to pay attention for fear you get hit with a foul ball. In other words, what we were doing is we had no money, but the object was to make it look as big as it could. It, the object was to make Wasp look like it had a million dollars, whether it did or whether it didn't. I tell you, I'm intense. I should have been born triplets. I got three times the intensity, three times the sex appeal, three times the macho, any man alive. You know why the guys all come to these shows and you never see girls? Because all the guys got their girls home locked up. They don't want them to come home sitting here seeing us because they go home getting the Vaseline and thinking about us. That's why they never come out here anymore. Well, when we did the Troubadour shows, we had the sorry with lost sign big letters. And we had these flames that go off around it. But we had different heights that we could put this sign to different places. Well, at that time, we got it down one click too low. When Blackie went up to start it with the torch, his hair was up and you know, had all the hairspray. And when he lit it, his hair lit. 
And these kids up in the front, they're going, yeah, burn, Blackie, burn. To create controversy, we uh, staged a blood drive with the American Red Cross in Los Angeles. And they brought down a semi-tractor trailer with a dozen beds and a half a dozen nurses. And I remember on the last day, I went into the, to this truck, this mobile unit that they had, and they lined about 100 pints of blood up on the wall. And I took a photo in front of it, and it hit me at that point what we had done. But even then, that was showing stages that WASP were the kind of band that were not content with status quo. Uh, as far as the band acquiring attention, we had been on the cover of four major international music magazines by then, and then that's what started the interest. At that point, major labels were starting to pay attention to us. There's a, a club here in Hollywood called Rainbow Bar and Grill, <clears throat> and it's, it's, I was born in the kitchen of this place. I mean, I live there whenever I'm at home. And I was walking through there, uh, through, the, through the bar area one evening, and there was a girl there that I knew, and she was sitting with this guy named Rod. And he says, aren't you such and such? Because I had been on the cover of, a, of an issue of an English magazine called Kerrang, which he was familiar with. And he says, uh, he says yeah, I've seen you guys. And he, and he starts going on and on and on about things that he didn't like about what we were doing. And I thought, who the hell are you? You know, I mean, I never met this guy before. So about three months goes by, and we were getting ready to play a show in Hollywood at the Troubadour. It was a special Halloween show, and this magazine I spoke about, Kerrang, had sent a photographer, Ross Halfman, out to sh do some photos of us. And Ross shows up, and he brings Rod along with him to this Halloween show, and Rod said he was coming along for a goof. You know, he didn't, think, he didn't take us seriously or what have you. Two days later, after we play the Halloween show, I'm walking through this Rainbow Bar and Grill again, and there's Mr. Rod Smallwood sitting there again. And he grabs me by the arm and he pulls me down in the seat and he immediately starts in on me about what I'm doing wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. You're not marketing right now. I go, who the fuck are you? You know, I says, here, I'm managing this band by myself and I'm doing this and I'm promoting it and I'm doing all this stuff by myself and I have no help and no money. And I says, where are you coming off from to tell me this? Now, the first time I met the guy, I, I, I hated him. The second time I met him, I liked him even less because now he's really coming down on me hard. Well, after we talked for about an hour, it dawned on me that he had designs on what we were doing, and he saw something there. By March of 1984, we had landed the deal with Capitol, and we had commenced recording the first album. In that first album was what was later to be regarded as maybe the most controversial song we've ever done, a song called Animal, I Fuck Like a Beast. Animal was a song that, because of its highly controversial lyrical content, was a song that people said would never get a lot of attention. We got a gold disc for it. The first album was called Wasp, and it was a, a collection of songs that had happened within the first year of us playing together. Uh, Tony Richards played drums on that first album, but Tony was not to go on any further with us after that. In walked Steve Riley who at the time was, was a godsend for us. Uh, it was, he was exactly what we were looking for at the time. Uh, Animal was probably the first song, Animal being I Fuck Like a Beast, was probably the first song that really caught on for the band. But I Want to Be Somebody was the first real anthem, something that could be exposed overall, exposed so to speak. Um, it came from an idea of, if you remember the old Barney Miller show, there was a guy on there named uh, Ron Glass who played the part of a guy named Detective Ron Harris. And over the course of the run of the show, the show ran for 11 years, over the course of the show, after about the fourth or fifth season, uh, Harris started writing a book called Bob, or Blood on the Badge. And... At, he had labored and labored over this book, and he finally got it published, and he's just going to his first autograph signing party, and he's, he's already asked Barney, who's Hal London, he asked him, he goes, can I get off early at, say, noontime to go and do an autograph signing for my book? And he says, sure. So he's, Harris is talking on the phone, he's talking to his publisher, and he's just about getting ready to leave, and a mugging detail comes in over the phone, and Barney says, Dietrich. You and Harris, go check it out. 
And Harris goes, but Barney, I have to go to my autograph. And he says, Harris, I said, now. And he slams down the phone and he says, God, I want to be somebody. Like, and I watched that and I laughed my ass off and I watched it. But then I thought about the genius of it. I thought, you know, there's got to be a lot of people that feel like that out there. Those those chicks, wow! I had this chick next to me, right? Like we were filming, and this poor bride, she was religious. I was saying stuff to her, and like she was cringing. Her eyes were red and stuff. And she, see, she was getting paid three hundred bucks a day, and she had to sit there and listen to my bullshit all day long for three days, and she was pissed off. I put it this way: I made three hundred. She got a day. I made it worth it. I made her work for her damn money. <laughs> and she was okay looking. I hope she sees this.
Good night. September of 1984, we embarked on our first world tour, which took us to England, Europe, Japan, and then back to America. And we were gone for about nine months the first time. We started on the UK leg of the tour, and that's where the Live at the Lyceum video came from. And that was a landmark video at that time because it shows people exactly what went on. But nevertheless, when you're doing a show like that, that, that is that visually intense, I think people are going to come out thinking they see things that never really happened, which is one of the beauties about rock and roll theater. Thunders down the highway. 
away. He is the man that doesn't die. He is the outlaw that rides. He is the hell yeah. If you know what WASP means, fine, and if you don't, that's fine too. It was the kind of thing that was designed to give everyone something to expand on, to give them some, some food for thought, so to speak, you know, give them somewhere to go. Uh, in that sense, the name has worked perfectly for us. I don't really foresee, or I don't see myself, the connections with the occult or what have you, because 
to me, well, I studied the occult for three years, and I know exactly what that stuff is about. <clears throat> I don't study this stuff anymore because I've since determined that uh, it's not for me. But for anyone to say that Wasp is an occult or a satanic band or anything like that, personally speaking, I think that's a bunch of bullshit. After we finished the first world tour, we got ready to start our second album, which was called The Last Command. Out of that came some great songs. Uh, one of them being the first video from that, which was a song called Blind in Texas. Uh, Blind in Texas was the song, and thereafter the video, uh, was an idea of something that happened to us on our first world tour. We actually, it's a true story, the things that happened there. We, sp we had about three days off there, and uh, we met a guy down there who owns a, a record store named... Uh, Texas Tapes and Records in Houston, Texas, a fine young man by the name of Jeffrey Hammer. And uh, Jeff is, Jeff is probably Spuds McKenzie reincarnated. You know, I mean, here's a guy that likes to have a good time. Uh, we got down there, and like I said, the three days off, this guy was, was playing the host to the max down there. So we had a good time, and we kept on having a good time. And the song actually came about, I wrote it in the middle of a blinding snowstorm in Minnesota one night. So it didn't actually, the event took place in Texas. The song was not written in Texas. It took, I guess, that long to recuperate after it was all over to try to figure out what was going on. Uh, after the song was recorded, it, we made a, our first video for the, for the album Last Command out of it. And I would say largely, if you look around my house here, and what have you, uh, you'll see things that are direct influences of that video. That, I mean, here's a city boy coming from New York. You know, it's for, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago, I'd be living, you know, here I am out here, the cowboy of Calabasas, the, the Ben Cartwright of rock and roll, I would have told him you were out of your mind. And I wouldn't have given it a second thought, but here I am today.
about a year and a half after the debut of our first album, we were commencing work of the, of the second album called Last Command. And right about that time, there was this wonderful organization that cropped up called the PMRC. And the PMRC stands, theoretically, for the Parents Music Resource Center. Uh, it's, in effect, an organization which is now defunct as we speak. So they're an evil organization in the sense that whenever you dictate to someone how to live their lives between now and 20 years ago, things should be left to the individual as to what they think they should or should not listen to. If you don't want to listen to what we're doing or you don't want to watch it, then don't buy it. Don't go see it. But there's no reason in the world for anyone to try to put a label on it.
we were in Finland, and we're playing there, and we go off stage, you know, for this encore, and all the people are like, you know, asking us, or screaming, come back well, on, right? It, all of a sudden, you know, we come back on, right? And Blackie's doing this, telling about the song. We had a song called Animal, uh, with I F like a beast, or, you know, F means fuck. I fuck like a beast. So, you know, I'm standing there, and there's no lights on. I can barely see anything. And all of a sudden, the next thing I can remember is I was looking at the ceiling, and my roadie drug me off stage, and I was looking at my aunt. And somebody had carried a rump rose about, <clears throat> about this big around. And it was like about 32, I'd say about 22 degrees outside, and it was frozen. And this kid had thrown it up on stage and smacked me in the face. That's like getting hit with about a 50-pound rock. <laughs> Bob, boom, and I was out. And they drugged me off stage. And next thing I can remember is just waking up. My roadie shaking me. Go, Chris, get up. You got to play. He just threw me back out on stage. Guitar is out of tune, everything. And I just went out and played a song, out of tune, laughing. I didn't care. The next day, I had a big welt on my head. I looked like a cyclops. You couldn't see my eye. We knew. Like, Randy was going to be leaving the band. We knew that already. So it was a perfect opportunity for me to go back and play guitar. So I told Chris, I said, I really don't want to play bass. I call bass a tool of ignorance. And uh, so I said, well, I, let me go back to playing guitar, because I'm a guitar player by trade. Anyway. I was in a band called King Cobra for about two years. We, we toured, uh, did some tours with Chris and that. And then uh, uh, I, we was, we went on, I went on tour, and it was King Cobra, Wasp, and Ted Nugent on tour. So we were, and we were finishing up the tour in, in Texas, right? And I, had, I talked to Chris a little bit at that time and, and became friends with him, but I didn't really know anything about that they, at that time they were going to make a change in the band. So when I got home, about three weeks later, somebody left a message on my machine. I came home one night, and it was all garbled as messages. And some guy said, John, this is Chris. Right home and call, call me at the so number. And I said, I'm not going to call this fool. It's a maniac. You know, I don't know who it is, so I didn't call, man. Then about three, three days, so I waited about three days later, and then I came home again, and there was a message on the machine. This time he was speaking clearly. I think he was sober at that point. <laughs> anyway, so, and he said, this is Chris Holmes from Wasp, and uh, give me a call. So I called him up next day, and he, he told me that they were interested in having me in the band. Would I come up and check it out? I'd come up and talk to Blackie, and I said, well, sure, man. I'll check out anything. You know, I'm ready for Freddie. I'm ready to check anything out, you know. So uh, I went up and talked to Blackie. Tell me what's happening and stuff, and I said, "Sure, I'm interested." So I went, I went and auditioned. I went auditioned about a week later, you know? and after the audition, they they held the gun to my head, you know, and they they said, they said, "Okay, listen, I right, listen, man, you're gonna join the band. If not, it's all over for your ass." <laughs> I said, "Oh, okay, man, okay, click." The third album, called Inside the Electric Circus, was an attempt to go back to where we had originally started with the original sound. The whole idea of Inside the Electric Circus is what the band's viewpoint was when we stood on the stage and looked out at the audience because it became a three-ring circus out there. We have seen things on a stage that the average audience participant will never witness because we get the whole picture up there. About Donington, the Donington, well, and people, they, like, they got this uh, custom over there where they like to, to fill... Uh, Plastic like containers full of piss, right? And they like to th like to throw them at the stage and see who they can hit, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, they <laughs> can't afford bathroom. But anyway, no, man. Yeah, I got hit. Yeah, right. I got hit with an apple in the face or anything else. But man, because they throw they throw a piss at us and it just hits the stage and explodes. So we so we get pissed off and we trash the stage, you know. And then we decided to throw it, throw the shit, man. I was trying to hit some kid down in the front with his Marshall cabinet, but man, I don't want to get sued, you know.
The video was directed by David Mallet. In London, it was done at Hammersmith Odeon. It was shot on the same day that we played Hammersmith Odeon. Later that night, when we played the actual show, we recorded for the BBC. And there were no overdubs on it or anything. Well, I had to go back to London a couple of days later after that, and I mixed it, and I was surprised at how good it really was. And I went back to the guys, and I says, I think we have something here. I think it's time to do what it is that we do best, which is a live performance. We were then looking for a video to come out of this, and we were approached with an idea for a movie for Ghoulies 2. We went and we looked at the, f at the footage, and we decided then at that point that Scream Until You Like It would be the perfect song to showcase an idea like this. To me, it's one of the better experiences that I've had because the people that ran these, these creatures made them come to life when we were doing this video. And after it was done, in all honesty, to watch these little guys be put in the box left me with a strange feeling. Which direction are you guys going now? How's the, how's the band uh, coming? What's Pomona, happening no. next? <laughs> that direction. We're going to well, Pomona. Which, you went that <laughs> way. For Coima. Towards the laundry. That direction. We're, we're going to be touring Los Angeles <laughs> and uh, the greater LA area in January. We're doing Pacoima, <laughs> Torrance, 
Um, Hawthorne, <laughs> Ballas Verdes. Downey. Reminded me of a girl I went out with one time. She told me she wanted me to kiss her with a small plane, so I took her to Thorns. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs>
isn't the stuff we normally do for you guys that are buying this. This is what happens when you consume massive amounts of drugs and alcohol. Douchebag blues Yes indeed 